So I work at a pizza place, usually inside as my insurance does not cover claims when driving for business, but occasionally I will cover a delivery shift for one of the drivers because the money is good. Our delivery area includes a few new development, upper middle class cookie cutter neighborhoods that give bad tips, an older village built almost a century ago that gives average tips, two apartment complexes who give great tips, some trailer parks which give no tips, and a bunch of rural areas, which usually give good tips. Not rural to the point seeing hundreds of stars at night, but enough that you couldn't hear your neighbors yell. So about a week ago, I was covering a delivery shift. I came back to the shop feeling pretty good. I'm averaging about $5 per delivery, and they have all been pretty close, and check to see if I have any more deliveries. I have one to an address I have never seen before. We have mostly regulars who get deliveries, so an address that doesn't seem the least bit familiar is odd. And it's out on one of the more rural roads. I asked the kid who took the order what was up because there were special instructions on the ticket. He says, they said go around back because the front door is not operational. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's not that uncommon. People often want you to go around back. Either they painted the door, the house shifted, and it's a bitch to open, or they are just hanging out back. So as I'm driving out to the house and I get an odd feeling, I don't really like the idea of going to the back of some house out in the sticks. It would all be too easy for some thugs to order a pizza to an abandoned house. There are quite a few in the more rural areas than jump the delivery guy. I figure I'll scope the place out when I get there and if it seems sketchy, just call them and make some bullshit about how it's against company policy to go around the back of houses to prevent robberies. As I am driving to the house, I realize it's towards the end of this road that gets less populated the further down you go. Great. I'm pretty near the address and driving slow. I see this house abandoned looking and set back from the roads with no address and in a bunch of trees, I think. That house better not be it. So I drive past and check the next house's address, and lo and behold, that abandoned looking one was the right house. At this point, I am not super worried though, because out in the boonies, the standards of upkeep on your house are pretty low, so a house in disrepair isn't unusual. So I double back to this house and pull into the driveway. At this point, I am getting bad vibes. It just doesn't feel right. So. I park my car at the very end of the driveway with the rear of the car on the shoulder so anyone passing by can clearly see it. At this point, I call back to the shop and tell them I'm at this sketchy house and if I don't call back in four or five minutes, call me and if I don't answer, call the cops. While I am on the phone, I take a chance to take a good look at the house. It looks extremely abandoned and not just in disrepair. The driveway is crumbling, bits are gravel and there are weeds growing out of it. There is no mailbox, no trash cans, no car, no lawnmowers, no landscaping, no kids' toys, absolutely nothing in the yard. The yard hasn't been mowed in what looks like years. The house is total crap. The roof is all but falling apart. The siding is falling apart. The back deck which comes around the side is falling apart. The only part of the house that looks even a little bit decent is the allegedly non-functioning. Front door. The windows are all shut. It's 95 degrees and humid, and this place does not have any air conditioning. They all have the blinds or curtains shut. The few that aren't are actually boarded up. I don't even see any wires running to this house. It's not dark, but it is dusk, and there isn't a sign of any lights on in the house. At this point, I am starting to get pretty nervous. I'm not a helpless person, but I do try to avoid any sort of confrontation I can, as I am mostly a pacifist. I'm not too concerned about getting robbed, no skin off my teeth, it's not my money. I mean, I would rather not get robbed, but I'm mostly worried about getting jumped or killed. It's a fairly safe area, but recently there have been some rather unsavory people moving in from the city. A big spike in home invasions and robberies, but more worrying a few stabbings and assaults. So it's time to either nut up or shut up. I'm not just going to go charging in there like a fool, so I get out my phone and call the number they gave when ordering. While I'm doing that, I'm also getting the pizza out and making sure to leave my door open. A running car half in the road at an abandoned house with the door open looks suspicious, right? I figure if shit goes down, it might look out of place enough 
to make someone stop, not that there is really any traffic this far down the road. I am starting to walk up to the house while the phone rings. It rings twice, and then an automated message comes on. It says something along the lines of this phone number is associated with an internet texting app, one of the free ones you download that lets you send free texts from a different phone number over a data connection. I think it was called Haywire. We have had issues with people using numbers from those services for pranks in the past. This is a huge red flag. My heart is now pounding in my throat and my whole body is telling me to bail. I don't want to get a reputation for being a flaky bitch as a driver and lose any future delivery shifts, and that is why I have not bailed yet. So I'm just standing there holding a pizza, looking at this house, but not wanting to venture around to the back of it. I'm hoping that the resident will look out the window and come out by the road to get their food. So I am looking at the front windows, checking for some sign of life. I see a blind go up on the one window next to the front door and a really creepy looking guy with a hat pulled low and big sunglasses on is looking out. Remember, he is in a completely dark house surrounded by trees. At dusk, there is no reason for him to be wearing sunglasses. I also see what appears to be a big guy standing behind him in the room. This could have been anything, though. When he sees me looking at me, mouths something, and he darts away, presumably towards the allegedly broken front door. At this point, I noped the fuck out. I had stayed pretty close to my car, so it was only a few steps away, so I jumped into the driver's seat and threw the pizza into my passenger seat, something I would never do since I am really anal about keeping my car clean. I slam it into reverse before I get the clutch all the way in so I grind my gears a little. Again, something I never do. Without looking, I simultaneously slam and lock my door and floor it backwards onto the main road, slipping my clutch horribly, but at this point, I don't care. I don't want to fuck around and risk a stall. I didn't even check for cross traffic, which was really stupid on my part. I start to drive away and look back at the house. The screen door on the outside of the front door is now open, but the front is still shut. The guy isn't out in the yard yelling, wait, come back or anything. He's just gone. So I pull over a little ways up the road to call back to shop and tell them I'm all good and I'll elaborate when I get back. The people never called back to inquire about their food. People usually call if their pizza is 15 minutes late and these people never got it. So it's really strange they didn't call pretty much confirming they were up to no good. After telling my coworkers about it, we concluded it was definitely a robbery, at the very least. So we put the address and phone number on our no deliveries list and ate their pizza. I doubt I would have actually gotten murdered or anything. Robbed with maybe a gun pulled or a little roughing up, yes. But it was still very unnerving that I easily could have gotten into some serious trouble by just doing my job especially if the idiots picked a slightly less abandoned house to set up at. Anyone who delivers pizza should be wary of situations like this. I looked into it, and apparently it is a pretty common way to rob pizza guys. I'm pretty glad we did not end up meeting. This incident happened around 10 years ago when I was 13 or 14 years old. It was unusually warm for my cold, cold country and my best friend and I, little rebels that we were, would lie to our parents about the time school ended and sit around in the school grounds gossiping and smoking cigarettes. Since we were idiot teenagers, we thought it was very cool to wear lots of makeup and heels in order to appear older, which will become important later on. That day it was around four or five in the afternoon and we were sitting around as usual. Even though we were busy chatting, we noticed a strange man enter the school gate. He was tall, skinny, early or mid-twenties, and nerdy-looking. The guy was carrying a single red rose, and we quietly made fun of him as he entered the building. We continued with our business until the man exited the main building, rose still in hand, and came over to us. He asked if we knew some girl who he claimed was his girlfriend. We said no, we haven't heard of her which was strange in retrospect because we made it our business to know everyone and everything in school. The man did not walk away. He sat down on the bench next to us and started asking more questions. What were we doing here alone so late? What did we do for fun? 
were we 18 yet? We ended up saying that we were 18, like the idiots we were. We started feeling less and less comfortable around him. He seemed a little off, unstable, like he could pounce at any second. He was especially fixated on my friend, which made sense because she was very tall, slim, and beautiful. So, after exchanging scared looks with her, we excused ourselves and left. While walking away from him, my friend noticed that he also got up and started following us, which scared us. A lot. The feeling that is often described here, the feeling of imminent danger, flooded my body and we decided to hide. Now the best move would have been to either go into the main building, where there was a security guard at the reception desk, or leave the grounds and walk onto a busy street. It would have been fine. But no, we went into an additional building. The building was a part of the original school building and had nothing there except a staircase about four floors high and two locked classrooms. As soon as we went in, we knew it was a mistake. We climbed a few steps and wanted to turn around and run, but we heard the door open and close. The man was inside. He was quiet. Surely he didn't want to talk anymore. I was a little bit higher on the stairs, so I ran up, leaving my friend below. This is definitely not my proudest moment. I was scared out of my mind and worried about my friend. I stopped for a second on the top of the stairs to gather my thoughts. Then I heard sounds of a struggle and my friend's muffled scream. I panicked. The man was taller and heavier than me. We were in an isolated building with no one there, and I had nothing that could be used as a weapon. But I had to do something. That's when I partly blacked out. I remember screaming and running and hitting and my friend's scared expression. The man ran away. We left the building, thinking he may be outside, waiting. But he wasn't. We went into the main building, staying close to the security desk. My friend told me what happened. Apparently, I went crazy. I ran downstairs in my heels, swinging my heavy book bag over my head, screaming insults no one has ever heard before at him. I beat the man violently over the head and in the face with the bag. My friend said I had an angry, out-of-control, animalistic expression on my face. We recovered a bit and left home. We never called our parents or the police. No one ever knew this story until recently. I'm not sure why we never reported the rapist bastard. Maybe we were afraid that it was our fault for hanging out late, wearing makeup and smoking. If I had the sense I do now, I would report him to make sure he couldn't hurt anyone ever again. And I would not feel guilty because some pervert thought we were 18, so naturally it was okay to rape us. So, creepy man who thinks it's okay to roam school grounds scouting for potential assault targets, screw you. I wish I had hit you harder. This happened around nine years ago when I was 11. The names have been changed. This is certainly fucked up. There was a girl at school called Amy who didn't have many friends. She was very quiet, and honestly, I thought she was a bit strange, but I felt like it would be nice to befriend her. We got talking, and she actually turned out to be really nice, and we became best friends rather quickly. It got to the point where I spent every weekend at her house, and then we would walk to school together. Even at my age, I knew there was something weird about her dad, Kevin. He was very interested in me, it seems, and always tried to fight and stuff, which is weird in itself. Whenever he was around, I felt weird. He was a short, fat man with gray-slash-white hair. Always has a weird smirk on his face and really wide eyes. It started off with stealing bits of my food when I wasn't looking and then laughing and making sure to put his arms around my shoulders to apologize. He'd always be wherever we were, upstairs, downstairs, or in the garden he always lurked about. There was a day Amy's grandma was visiting Amy's mother's, mum, and Kevin kissed her grandma on the mouth hello, which was fucking weird anyway, but then turned into the creepiest, sloppiest French kiss. Everyone except me and Amy found it funny. She put on a smile when her family looked over, but I was horrified. Maybe I shouldn't have gone back, but I felt like I had to, for Amy. After that, there was a day we were playing in her room, and Kevin came in and started an argument over nothing. 
It got heated and he grabbed rubbish bags saying he was going to throw all of her toys away. Of course, an 11 year old is gonna go mad if they think their dolls are being thrown away. So she was hysterical. We followed him downstairs where he told her if she spoke to him like that again, she would regret it. It was then he started to remove his belt. What the fuck? She pushed me towards their front door, which is just in front of the stairs, so we could run out of it, but she was sort of half laughing as if she was trying to convince me it wasn't serious. I could tell it was. I got out the door, but when I turned around and waited, Kevin slammed it shut, but not the porch door, and then all I heard was Amy screaming at the top of her lungs. I was so scared, but I didn't want to leave her. I just stood there. Eventually, I found the courage to go back in, and I went upstairs to Amy, who was brushing her doll's hair. She smiled at me, but she had a tear-stained face. There were no visible marks, but all that was on show were her arms, so he could hit her anywhere. I then felt as if I had to protect her, so I continued going there and didn't tell my mom a thing. One night, I woke up thirsty, and we were close enough for me to just go get myself a drink, so I went downstairs and Kevin was laying there on the floor, in the dark, with nothing but tidy whities on, and he just stared at me. It was the creepiest thing. Just the street lamp from outside shining through a gap in the blind lit up the room enough to see. I didn't get myself a drink, I just ran back upstairs. I wouldn't go there after that until I knew for sure he wouldn't be there and I didn't sleep over anymore. I'm not sure if I've ever told my mom, but I think she'd go and kill him. I was talking to Amy recently, and she opened up to me because she sent me her mental health assessment sheet. When she was 10, she woke up to Kevin raping her 15-year-old sister. Kevin isn't her sister's dad, not that it makes it any better, was screaming for Amy. It also stated that he beat Amy on a regular basis. Most recent was two years ago. He beat her up in front of a friend, and her friend called the police. I told her the things I'd seen and how I knew something wasn't right. All I know of him now is that he's in hospital suffering with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and I don't give a fuck.